Blog Talk Radio. First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this the hottest day of the week. Levels in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates the bringer by specifics and the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. Proceeding levels in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates the bringer by specifics and the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this is, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. You have to activate the pipe in which that produced this black chemical called melanin. We, what we did was gave a hard line in the sand between the different definitions of Esoteric study and exoteric study. Playtime is over. This is Brother Fahim with an L. Will and answer Dr. Asur Aline Luther Park Il Bay for tonight. And our topic for our show tonight will be the history of the Omex. The Omex, and I have, probably have to mention the Washita as well. It's the other Washita Moors because they're, they're both related. And so, therefore, the history is mainly somewhat together also. So, I don't want to exclude the Washita Moors and just uh, just talk about exclusively about the Omex. So and then we'll be talking about also about other uh, Aboriginal indigenous tribal nations uh, up the Americas and Africa as well, and the difference between uh, certain terms that they use uh, for Moors. Derogative terms, I may say. So uh, we'll get on with that. I'm gonna start with the book first by They Came Before Columbus: The African Presence in Ancient America by Ivan Van Sertima. All right. It says here. <clears throat> he first. His first ploy before was to talk about that he could use his influence on behalf of Columbus if the need were to arise to see that in his agreement with regard to the discoveries were honored 
Columbus had drafted agreements with the Spanish sovereigns before setting out, making him a partner with the crown in his prospective discoveries. These agreements referred to in his diaries as capitulation had been finalized in his absence and a copies of, a doc, of uh, the documents submitted to the Portuguese king, Don Juan. See, so he had looked at these very clo- at these very closely. He understood from, the, um, from his reading of them that the real credit for the conquest belonged to Columbus. He was then to emphasize that this was Columbus' personal conquest, implying that it was well within the power of the admiral even now to bargain over those lands with any foreign prince with whom he might come to an agreement. Columbus was cautious. He had not yet seen the capitulation. He said he knew nothing more than the king and queen of Spain had advised him not to encroach on Portuguese territory during his journeys, not to go on to San, to San George de Mina, nor to any other part of Guinea. This is also in West Africa. And this has been announced in all the ports of Andalusia before he set sail. This was, the, this was his way of saying that Spain and her agents fully respected the Portuguese sphere of power and influence and that the Portuguese were expected to show equal respect for theirs. Columbus also seemed to imply that he needed no one to act as protector or go-between in the matter of any agreements he might enter with the sovereigns of Castile. To this, Don Juan graciously responded that he was certain that he had that he was certain mediators would not be necessary in this matter. Okay. Now we all know that Columbus didn't really discover America. It wasn't his quest because he he uh, he never reached the lands of the American shores. It was believed that he had really. Uh, reached the shores of so-called India, which is Hindustan. Okay? Now, go on. Here he has, uh, whatever Columbus may have personally known or felt or plotted, his argument, nothing but water to the east, to the east of a demarcation line was the best to counter Spanish suspicious, suspicions and objections to the pact. It was a worse argument, however, to present to the court if he wanted to secure immediate promotion of further explorations to the south. If the theme of the first voyage had been discovery and exploration, the theme of the second one was, ex- was colonization and consolidation. The order went out. Take 2,000 Spaniards with you. Plant a colony. Build a church. Build a city. Let us have forts, farms, towns. Above all, pursue vigorously. But the search for gold whenever a break from ordinary labors will permit. Stop right here. Now you see, you, uh, uh, you heard me say, set up a church, forts, farms, a church. So, you know, this is their first encroachment on their Christian dome upon the aboriginal indigenous people of the Americas. This is what he's talking about. Okay, let me go on. The building of the new city of Isabella to subdue and convert the natives of the Caribbean who had massacred the first settlement of Spaniards and demolished their fort, occupied most of Columbus' time until his return from his second voyage in 1496. <coughs> While in Hispaniola, however, something happened that confirmed and complemented what Don Juan had said. The Indians gave good proof that they were trading with so-called black people. They brought the Spanish concrete evidence of this trade. The Indians of the Hispaniola and said that they had come to Hispaniola a black 
people who have the tops of their spears made of metal, which they call gunan, of which he, Columbus, had sent samples to the sovereigns who have been assayed when it was found that uh, 32 parts of 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper. The origin of the word Gonin may be tracked down in the Maldive languages of West Africa through Mandingo, Mandingo, Kabunga, Taranka, Kankaka, Bambara, Mande, and V. And V, we have the form of the word Kani, which, trans- which translated into native phonetics would give us guanin. In Columbus, the journal of gold is given as kona, C-O-A hyphen E-N-A, which guanin is recorded as an island where there is such there is much gold. Okay, this is what they are looking for, gold, silver, anything that uh, they can lay their hands on to rape our lands for their own personal agendas. Let me go on. It says here, the African spears presented by the Espanola Indians, which corroborated Don Juan's statement about the Guinea boats, but just one of the number of new factors pushing Columbus towards the exploration of the route from Guinea. His brother Bartholomew arrived in Espanola in command of three Caravels on June 24, 1494. The Admiral had not seen his brother for many years, and Bartholomew knew more. Les Casas tell us that Christopher himself, of the intelligence coming out of the Portuguese African world, Bartholomew had worked as a choreographer in Lisbon, where there he had been had drawn numerous maps for mariners, and he witnessed yearly the return of ships which had been navigating to the western lands of Africa by way of the ocean. Enlightened by enlightened, enlightened and moved by the tales told him by those who refused, as one might say, from another world, and himself more versed in maritime affairs. He communicated to his elder brothers his reasons and arguments, proving to him that in sailing away from the southern part of Africa and directing his course straight upon the ocean sea, he would surely arrive at continental land. Talking about the Americas again. Okay. Now I'm going to start with the book called A History of African Olmecs. Black Civilization of America from Prehistoric Times to the Present Era. Okay. <laughs> it is very likely that very first inhabitants of the Americas were <laughs> so-called Nicotic blacks from Africa and Asia who arrived in the Americas earlier than 100 years before Christ. Okay, I'm stop right here. What they are talking about 100 years before Christ, or a little bit longer than that, it could have been. We really don't know because um, you can't. No one can really trace our history, because our history always go back further, even further than 100 years, further than some say 2 billion years. So no one can really say uh, which, which, how long, or what time, or when did we start on this earth land. No one can uh, can trace our history. No one really knows, okay? Here we go. This occurrence would have taken place during the period in human history when the only Homo sapiens were so-called Negrotech blacks and more and recent migrants from Africa who entered into an uninhabited North and South America. To understand this possibility, which is becoming more factual as further evidence is gathered, we must consider the fact that Multi-chondrial DNA studies done over the years have already fortified the evidence which points to the monogenetic origins of all humans present to a source somewhere in Central Africa. Furthermore, all humans came from this Africa source and developed into distinct races only about 40,000 years ago. 
This means that the so-called black race, Negro Tech, existed for more than 100,000 years before all other races came into being. Okay. Uh, well, he's saying that uh, everything came from Africa. Those of you that are more cognizant, more or more uh, seven level of consciousness, that knows very well that we are the original inhabitants of this earthland, meaning we are the original man and we are original woman or man. Okay, we all know this. So therefore, there are some Moors that will tell you, or some uh, a Moor scientist will tell you that we haven't came from anywhere. We were always here in the Americas. We didn't come from anywhere. We were always already here. Same thing with China, or uh, Japan, or any other country that we had inhabited. Because how many people really know we are the first really Chinese, of the original Chinese, the original people, the inhabitants of China, were Moors, or you could say Manchuria. Because Manchuria is the, actually the country, and China is the corporation. But I'll get get with you on another subject on that, another topic. I'm turning you on to the history of the Omex. All right. Bloggers' law supports the idea that humans originated in Africa and migrated to other regions. Those who went to the cold northern lands adapted to the cold climate. In fact, according to Sheikh Antadiop, Bloggers' law states that warm-blooded animals originating in a hot and humid climate would be pigmented. This fact clearly indicates that the very first humans to inhabit the Americas and the entire world came out of Africa between 200,000 to 100,000 years ago. According to the global the Gladwin thesis, Blacks were in the Americas as early as 70,000 B.C., before Christianity. These first blacks may have been in an astraloid type of, of well as diminutive blacks such as the Pygmies, Octa, Bushmen, and others. Stop right here. Okay. You're talking about these blacks may have been the astraloids from Australia, what he's talking about. Well, I'm here to tell you there's no such race of people as uh, uh, astraloids. They are Aboriginal indigenous people of us, uh, so-called continent of Australia. As a community of blacks such as pygmies, pygmies, what he has talked about, pygmies is a, uh, what you call a misnomer for Twa, for the Twa people. They were very short in stature. These were the Twa. The Pygmies is a social, political, Western European term for Twa people. Okay, let me go on. It is unlikely that the prehistoric blacks who remain have been discovered in the in the Americas, evolved from Mongoloids and developed in Situ in the Americas into Negritic racial type. Okay, stop right here again. Okay, the Mongoloids, he's talking about Asians, people from Mongolia that came from the Barren Straits through Alaska, through Canada. That's how uh, uh, the, what can I say, the most distorted history of the first inhabitants, what they teach a lot of people, uh, that they were here first. And we came after them from the, uh, from, uh, the African continent. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. We were here before them. We were the first inhabitants of America, period. Okay? Uh, the, 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 the so-called Mongoloids, uh, what they are talking about, they're referring to as Asians. That's what they're referring to. Okay? All right, let me go on. This idea can be refuted due to the fact that human humans entered the Americas between 30,000 years BC to 150,000 years BC. They would have had they would have had to have been Negroid. 
okay? We all know, again, there's no such uh, people, group of people called Negroid, okay? So I'm I'm always, if you notice, I'm always uh, pronouncing these words, uh, these, what you could say, these derogative words as to what us referring to us, because this is the way the book was written. So if you can get past Negroid, Negritic, Negro, Blacks, African American, people of color, uh, you can get past it. This is a very interesting and very informative book. Okay? But I'm going to go on. All right. It says here, prehistoric Blacks were moving worldwide. Consequently, the prehistoric Migrate migrants migrants to the Americas during the period would have had to have been Negroid and black, Negroid and black. Okay, which one is the, the, the difference? What he's trying to make a difference out? I don't know. Okay, so it seems more possible that people who were Negritic changed into the Mongoloid type in the Americas and other in, in order to adapt to the cold climate in the north. In fact. The Kong and the Sand peoples of Southern Asia, who live in climates regions similar to that of the East Asia, the cold, windy, high veldt of Southern Africa, poses the so-called Mongoloid characteristics, such as yellow, yellowish, brown skin, short stature, and the epicentus eye fold. Yet, genetically and in the most other aspects, they are typically Negroids. With features that can be found from the tip of southern Africa to North Africa among the various Negritic peoples. These Negritic peoples are among the earliest examples of the prehistoric Homo sapien types who once settled the entire world before the development of the distinct races in various parts of the planet. Furthermore, findings based on the middle chondrial DNA prove without a doubt that the earliest ancestors of the Homo sapiens alive today came from Central Africa. The place of origin of the pre-Columbian blacks who inhabited the Americas had been placed in a number of geographical regions, including the Americas itself. Yet, based on the close similarities between cultural assets found in West Africa, particularly during the ancient pre-Christian Ghana Empire, 3000 B.C. to 400 A.D., and those of ancient Mexico. Many anthropologists, historians, and scientists, such as Ivan Van Sertima, in his book, which I got to read a little bit earlier, they came before Columbus, written in 1976. Alexander von Wuthenthal, Unexpected Faces, uh, his book called Unexpected Faces in Pre-Columbian America, and Andrzej Wyszynski, the Polish uh, craniologist, have concluded that there is a significant ancient African presence in ancient Mexico. Studies conducted, politicians, historians, and others on blacks and old Mexico show cultural similarities not merely with ancient China and Ghana, but with West Africa in general. For example, Ivan Van Sertima's quote of RAs Jarohal's quote from the Quit Maya book, the Tutulo Koya, quickly, uh, clearly points to a West African origin and influence with some of the cultural contributions to Omeg artists, works which portray black African types or negative features. In his address, the Smithsonian, Van Sertima, points out that the Maya oral tradition describes artifacts and materials brought to Mexico by people who most likely came from West Africa. These things came from the east east of the Gulf of Mexico, from the east the other side of the water and the sea. They came here, they had their thrones, their little benches and stools, they had their parasols and their bone flutes. These items are very common in West Africa and were, are used by chiefs, kings, noblemen, and their entourages. Such items are symbolic of power and the influence. In fact, golden stools of, or replicas are still carried by the Ashanti nation of Ghana, along with large multicolored 
umbrellas, flutes of bone and ivory, as well as trumpets and horns of the same materials. The period in which these observations were made by the Maya have been have been any time between 1800 B.C. to 1000 A.D. This record may have survived from a very early period in the history of Mexico, when Africans and Native Americans, so-called Native Americans, met somewhere in the Bay of Campoche. During this period, whether it was as early as 1800 B.C. or as late as 1000 A.D., Ghana was to was in, 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 was in existence first as a prehistoric kingdom and what is today Mauritania about 8000 BC. In fact, this very region may have been the home of one of the most ancient civilizations on Earth, according to my better news. South Holland, Illinois, called the Zinga Empire, existed in the present locations of the Mauritania about. 15,000 years ago, one of the most famous emperors was Tyrus Afrique, who designed the African standard, the red, black, and green flag. So we all know the red, black, and green flag. We know that flag as well. That's called, and here we call that the liberation colors. It's both the link of the red, or both the link, link to the blood of the people. The black folks were linked to the dark complexion of the people, and the green would represent the land. That's the meaning of the liberation flag, all right? Well, let me go on. There are three periods which covers the history of Ghana. The first period was a continuation of a prehistoric civilization which existed in Sahara during the west from the wet phase, when much of the existing lake-covered areas have given way to dry, fertile forested, covered terrain, a culture which practiced agriculture and were connected to the Mendi who existed in West Africa. This, that same culture developed into great civilizations between 3000 B.C. to 400 A.D. and continued to exist up to about 1000 A.D. It was from the Ghana, and it was from this Ghana during the periods mentioned that most of the ancient blacks whose likeness still exists at Olmec, stonework of Mexico, sailed from Africa and Mexico. Ghana's earliest roots began in the region of Mauritania about 15,000 years ago. New information places a civilization called the Zinga Empire in the region of this very ancient period. During more recent times, between 10,000 B.C. and 3,000 B.C., the Mindy, the Mindy agriculture complex and the Niger-Congo language family family developed. This development was followed soon afterwards by by Nok civilization, N-O-K, Nok civilization, which placed an emphasis on highly technical and fine works of terracotta art, ironware, weapons, utensils, cotton, cloth, and textiles, gold, and gold ornaments, weapons, and currency. Civilization in this region continued to the Renaissance phase of Ghana, of the Ghana civilization, which was perhaps between 400 B.C. to 1000 A.D., a very long period. Nigerian officials have dated some of the ancient Terracotta of the Nok region, which spread its influence all over the Western Africa to about 2700 B.C., according to a book, A General History of Africa, Volume 2. Okay, now here we go called the statement called Olmec Origins. I can repeat, Olmec Origins. There is no doubt that the Olmecs were composed of people who had distinctly Negroid features and cultural traits identical to Africa and to West Africa, and particularly with connection to the Nile Quarter and the Sudan. Some historians have stated that the colossal Olmec stone heads contain African features. However, there are still a small number of so-called academians who refuse to accept the fact that so-called blacks were in the, in the Americas thousands of years before said Christ. Yet particularly 
racial and cultural characteristics unique to Africa, particularly West Africa and the Nile Sudan region, can be found on these gigantic heads, as well as hundreds of terracotta, terracotta figurines found throughout Mexico and Central America over, pa- over the past 100 years. Among the examples of culture and racial traits found in West Africa, Sudan, and pre-Columbian Mexico are keloid tattoos on an Africoid Olmec bus and in Bersitima's book, they came before Columbus. They they look strikingly identical to caloric scars on the on the face of the Nur girl photographed in National Geographic. The Nurs, Nubas, Nubians, Dinka, and other Africans found in the southern parts of Sudan are the pure, uncorrupt (parentheses, parentheses by alien religious beliefs and racial mixing). But stop right here. What they mean? You know what they mean by racial racial me, uh, mixing? But they're talking about by alien religions. And and uh, we know what he's talking about: Christianity, uh, uh, Judaism, uh, Islam. Well, all of those religions actually come from us anyway, from our uh, old African mystery systems and schools. But the Europeans have came to our lands and corrupted them into their own belief systems and mind control systems that they that they are today. Even Islam, a lot of them have been produced to a mind control institutions. Okay. But that's not the Islam we have uh we are about in the Moorish Divine National Movement. Because I look at Islam as a religion but also Islam as the nature of the Aboriginal indigenous Asiatic woman and man. Okay, let me go on. Okay. Uh, let's see where we at here. The so direct descendants of the ancient Chemites. Okay, it has the parentheses Egyptians. Chemites, or Chem, you know, uh, that's where you uh, get the word chemical from. Uh, alchemical. Chemax means the dark land. Egyptian is the Greek term for Kemet. Okay, and Nubians, who controlled the region before the invasions of Semitic and Indo European barbarians after 1700 BC. Here again, uh, when we're dealing with the word barbarian and barbary and barbaric, uh, actually, that's a term that was used for Moors by the Romans. You can read uh, uh, Ivan Van Sertima's book, uh, The Golden Age of the Moor. He touches a bit on that, on that subject. As dealing, uh, You can read the book if you can find it, but it's very hard, difficult to find. It's called The, uh, the Treaty with the Barbary, uh, the Barbary Coast of the America and the Barbary Treaties. Okay, it speaks on that. Okay, let me go on. Okay, it said the wearing of the dis lip or lip plates by some individuals in tribes such as the Ubangi and Southern Ethiopians also is also a custom among present day American Indians in South America and was the custom during the Olmec dynasties about 1,000 years ago. In fact, some terracotta and, and those figurines and heads which present Negroid persons who, I mean, who show this characteristic, a large stone head which portrayed the typical Indian racial characteristic also show the plate, the plate lift picture. Now I'm going to give with the the word the term Ethiopia also is a Greek term that they use for Abyssinia. So uh, uh, the uh, of the uh, 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 they have a lot of the, the corruptions or misnomered names. 
for countries like Abyssinia, or like Ethiopia for Abyssinia and Egypt for Kemet. So keep bearing that in mind as I go further. Okay? All right. An article written by M. Grundy in Ancient American Volume Number 3, Issue 18, okay, makes a statement that further research would, would have made unnecessary. He states the vast majority of figurines portrayed have distinctly Far Eastern facial characteristics. They have narrow slanted eyes, and their hair is always portrayed as perfectly straight without any suggestion of the tight curls. Hmm. Of course, there were Asiatic Olmecs in Mexico. These resembled the Chinese more than any other Mongoloid group, including the Native Americans. Yet, a significant number of the Olmecs were blacks of the African Negritic type. Their racial characteristics and features are distinct from that of, Mongo of the Mongoloids, and their curly hair is carved from the top of one of the masses' heads of bas basalt. Another giant stone had found at Trezapotis. Number two was carved with six African braids and tassels on the back of the head. A large stone had carved in the front of what was a large stone sarcophagus. Not only portray portrays typical Af African Negroid racial features, but the hairstyle is clearly an Afro hairstyle. This head was carved around 1100 B.C. and is now being displayed at San Andre Andres, Tuxla, Veracruz, Mexico. Van Sertima's African presence in early America also contains a number of Negroid Olmec statuettes and terracotta works with hairstyles used by Africans in Africa and nowhere else, including the Pacific and East Asia. African hairstyles own Uses used only in Africa and not in the South Pacific and Asia, where at least 400,000 or 400 million straight-haired, curly-haired, and kinky-haired Negroes presently reside. Tribal scarification, goatee beard with slanting and non-slanting eyes, both types are found among the specific African nationalities such as Kakong San, Man Betu and others, and even hairdressers common among West Africans in ancient times and and to this day are a part of the characteristics of a large number of typically black African portrayals. These have been found among those works that have been sculpt, sculpt, sculpted with the typical Asiatic or American bungalow characteristics. The question which confuses many researchers is where the Mongoloid Native Americans, the original creators of Olmec civilization, or where they joined by African Americans or Africans from West Africa, the Sudan Egypt region, or even blacks from the Chang or Xia, Xia dynastic period of ancient China, wherein blacks were a significant proportion of the Chinese population in rural China's southern regions. As I said before, uh, we were also the original inhabitants of China. The original inhabitants of China was Aboriginal Indigenous Moors, uh, no doubt, because I will say before and I say it again, we are the original people or the original inhabitants of this earth land. It is my belief that uh, actually we were all from all these continents and eight uh, of uh, all these continents on the earth. Not just Africa, but all over the earth. Um, uh, one can say mm, it may all started in Egypt, all started in Nubia, but some people may say m maybe not. Maybe a lot of these things were started here in the Americas. Although there are certain mounds, uh, I was watching on the uh, a DVD uh, dealing with the Olmecs and the Washita Empire. And they had certain mounds that predated the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. I don't know how many thousands of years. So it, it's sort of, uh, hmm, 
uh, the, the sort of kind of, you know, I don't really know, but the everything is most people is geared towards uh, the first civilization started from Africa. So I'm going to get off that. I'm gone. It says here, the colossal Olmec heads portray eyes that are common among the vast number of Africans of ancient times as well as of today. It is has always been possible to find at least three out of ten Africans with the slant eye characteristics commonly known as the epicontic bowl. In some nationalities, tribes such as the Kong San Mandubetu, the Saharan nomads and settlers of Bantus and the West Africans, the vast majority of members do carry this facial characteristic which is developed due to the types of environments these Africans inhabit. The slant-eye characteristic is also common among the African Americans, so-called African Americans, of today, as well as blacks in other parts of the Americas. High cheekbones are very common among blacks in Africa and the Americas, yet these features did not originate with mixing with the Native Americans, but were part of the general set of racial features of Africans coming from the west region of Africa, the Congo region, and the central southern Africa, the Diego River Museum, the Jose Sainz Collection of the Alexander von Wudenthal Humanities Americas Collection, Tang's work of Terracotta created by the Omex with racial features that are unmistakably African and Negroid. Some anthropologists and historians have asked for the skeletal remains in black Africans as proof that they were in the Americas in Mexico during the black Olmec dynasties 1100 B.C. to 400 A.D. Indeed, proof exists for the physical existence of blacks in the Americas not only in Mexico but throughout the Americas. For example, skeletal remains of blacks were found and analyzed by the Polish chronologist Andrzej Wazinski, according to Van Sertima. Van Sertima states that Wazinski noted that 13.5% of skeletons examined in this pre-classic Olmec cemetery of Tulactico were African. In late years, the number decreased to 4.5 due to intermixing with the Native American Mongoloid population. The skeletal remains these African remains of these Africans found in the Olmecs sites were not remnants of the of the original prehistoric Negroid black Africans and black astroloid Africoid migrants who began arriving in the Americas during a period from 70,000 years before the present through 10,000 years ago, but were more recent Africans from the West African region, the Nile Sudan area, and Shang and Xia China who may have arrived between 6,000 B.C. to about 400 A.D. These Africans sailed from Africa across the Atlantic to the Caribbean region, Mexico, Central America, the southern states, and the eastern region of the U.S. In fact, the Oshita Nation, or what is used to uh, be the Louisiana Territories, had lived on this continent of the U.S. Okay. Now he says, he said the Oshita. The Oshita, when he's talking about the Washita, the United Washita, the Dudamandia Moor Empire. I myself uh, also have blood lineage to the Washita, uh, the Dudamandia Moor Empire. My great great grandmother, her name was East Star. That was her name. And. Uh, I, I, I found out through research, uh, through family research, that she was a Choctaw, which is the same as the Washita. To show you, uh, I'm one of uh, probably the many Moors in this uh, North America that are uh, that gives proof that we are the original inhabitants of this Earthland. All right. One of the great puzzles in regards to the African Olmec connection concerns why 
there would be an African presence among a people who appear to be distinctly Asiatic and possibly of Chinese origins. Okay, let me stop here again. Okay, I have certain um, personal discussions with certain Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Koreans, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of the Asian continent that, uh, that uh, so-called resides over here. And each time I talk to them, I never recall them ever, ever refer to themselves as Asiatic. Okay? Uh, they always refer to themselves as Asians. Just Asians. It's A S A S I A N S. Asians or Asian. A S I A N. Asian. Never Asiatic. Okay? So Asiatic is another, as you could say, another Western uh, political social term for Asians. Like Native American is a social political term for the indigenous or uh, so-called Indians in the Americas. Okay, let me go on. Okay. Many find this connection to be mind-boggling and far-fetched, yet there was indeed an ancient connection between Africans who migrated from the region of Cameroon, West Central Africa, what they're talking about, with prehistoric China. Cameroon is the very same region with Bantu-speaking Africans began a massive migration in all directions earlier than 1,000 years before Christ. In fact, an ancient Bantu script found in Cameroon called the but the Bamoon script. This clearly shows that the ancient people of Cameroon have spread more than 2,000 miles from their home base towards northeast Africa and further towards Mesopotamia and China in the east, as well as across the Atlantic to the Americas in the west. A significant piece to this puzzle is the fact that a black dynasty or large number of blacks were part of the Xia and Shang in 1788 to 1122 B.C., a period when blacks consisted, consisted of a large proportion of the Chinese population and ruled their own nations in the southern part of China. According to Wayne B. Chandler, there was a black African element in ancient and pre-Chinese China. The largest element during the Shang culture was the classical mongoloid type and the oceanic negroid having a major influence on Shang culture and civilization. Furthermore, the Chao dynasty, who overthrew the Shang dynasty, described the Shang people as having black and oily hair. Also, Negroid artifacts and works which portray faces clearly show African racial characteristics, such as hairstyle, including braids and mohawk type short cropped hair, flat noses, non slanting eyes, full lips, and other. These works were found in the Shang Dynasty, a last capital called Anyang. It must be pointed out that there, uh, there is a region in Cameroon called Anyang where the ancient black back tribes responsible for developing civilization in ancient Mesopotamia Elam and the Far East are said to have originated. <clears throat> Those of you that have studied the uh, uh, the esoteric meaning of the uh, the Moore Science Temple Circle Seven know what they're talking about when they say Elam. Okay, or oh, we may say Eloa. Keep going. Okay. Wayne B. Chandler explained that the Bach people came out of Africa and founded by the civilization of the ancient Akkadian and Elamites. Chandler writes, the language of the Bach families, spelled B-A-K, Bach, okay? The language of the Bach families, which under the leadership of yu Ne Huang T, or yu Hei Wang D, Hang Na Kun Te, arrived about 2280 B.C. on the banks of the Lo River in 
Shenxi, China, and was deeply rooted with that of the Akedo Sumerians of Elam, Babylonia. Chandler also pointed out that the saying Yu Ne Huang Di was translated to Hu Not Kunte. Kunte itself is a Mende name. Kunte itself is a Mende Mendinka name. I, you have to say so because you, you remember uh, those of you who had uh, saw the television uh, uh, movie uh, Roots remember the Kunta Kente, uh, Kunta Kente, you know, so and he was of the Mandinka. He was a Mandinka warrior, if you were, if you were, can remember. He was uh, a member of the Mandinka tribe of Ghana or of Gambia, I may say. So, okay, let me go on. The revelation is indeed interesting since, May, since, since many of the names in the Cameroon region of the Central West Africa sound very similar to Chinese names. It should also be noted that the Mendi have been credited for creating the first agricultural complex in West Africa between 6,000 to 5,000 B.C., this complex, including a large part of the now dry Sahara, and and these the very same people who transported in the African cotton, African an African cotton to the Americas during the same period and blended it with an American, an American cotton. Has a prevent has a, a question mark on it because some people believe that cotton didn't originate here in America. A lot of people believe that the cotton originated in Africa. Okay, so let me go on. <clears throat> Gandhi explains the ancient America, May June 1997 issue, number 18, page 16, that the migrants from the old West Africa, Asia, do, do not appear to have left any archaeological trail or similar relics clearly linking their Central American civilization with that of the Far East or Africa. The hard truth goes against this statement, for there was a civilization in ancient West Africa with a terracotta, bronze, and iron crafts producing industries. In fact, terracotta works identical to that of the Olmec, both in their portrayal of African blacks as well as in this, in this style of creation or quite numerous. The culture was the Nok civilization, which grew in the agriculturally rich southern Sahara and spread throughout West Africa as early as 3000 B.C. West African officials had already compared with Nok to Rakota and stoneworks with that of the Omex and declared them to be identical in many aspects and, be and belonging to the same types of Africans. The carving of giant stone he is also an African tradition practiced in ancient times as well as this to this very day. This tradition was practiced throughout Nubia, Egypt, Kush, West Africa. In fact, this is an African invention. The tradition of carving giant heads of important person in one of the most important aspects of the African carving tradition. Get that again? This is an African creation. This is an African in, uh, 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 invention. Europeans and other people not invent this. Moors did. That's why you see a lot of buses and, and sculptures around the world. This is where the Europeans and other, other races and group of people have got this practice from, from our ancient forebrothers and forefathers. But uh, you will not hear this in your schools or in your history classes, never. They're not going to never teach our children that in their schools, or their children for that matter, you know, to tell them that our ancient foremothers and forefathers had civilized and educated them, them, Europeans, and other peoples of the world? No. Then things will have to change around a whole lot then. It will change a lot of things around. All right, let me go on. Tradition 
of carving giant heads of important persons is one of the most important aspects of the African carving tradition. The heads of kings and other important officials carved during the Nubian military and political influence and control of Egypt. As in parentheses, 1100 B.C. to 600 B.C. can be seen at the Nubian capital of Tennis in Lower Egypt. Brand Sertima comments on the continuation of this tradition in which massive, gigantic stone heads are still carved in Africa today. The Africans are still making these colossal heads. Look at the modern one plate 12, now on display at the Boston Museum. It is almost as high as the floor of the museum. Brand Sertima presents a number of cultural similarities between the Olmec monarchies ceremonial props and that of the ancient Africans. Hmm. Okay. Go on, see. It says here, uh, this chapter here it says, where blacks in the Americas it has a question. It has a question here. It says, were blacks in the Americas before the Mongoloid invasion? No. Okay. The answer is right now. The above question has already been answered, which it has. Because of, uh, it has been answered by a lot of our uh, historians of the more, uh, Divine National Movement and of the Washita, these are the Mandia Moors as well. We are the, we're known as the oldest Aboriginal indigenous group of people on the on this earthland that has been proven and has been uh, also been proven uh, by the United Nations. Our United Nations number project number is two one five slash nine three. It has been recognized by almost by almost all the nations across the globe. So yes. We are the oldest. If we are the oldest group of Aboriginal and Indigenous people, therefore, what does that make every everybody else on the planet and other tribal nations here in the Americas and Af- on the African continent as well? Then they all are descendants from our ancient foremothers and forefathers. If I'm wrong, correct me. I don't have a... Uh, <clears throat> A key, a key to punch you in. So I'm sure I'll have somebody that probably will object to me what I'm saying. But you want to uh, put me to a challenge. As I say for that, bring it on. Okay? All right, let me go on. It says here, the above question has already been answered. Blacks, blacks were in the Americas before the evolution of the Mongoloid type from the original Homo sapiens and Negroid type who entered Asia over 100,000 years ago. Blacks were in the Americas when no other racial group existed, and these blacks, according to solid evidence, that evidence were in the Americas as early as 70,000 years before the present. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. Now, <clears throat> to say we uh, 70,000 years before any other racial group was present, this is not any biased statement against any racial group and against the Asians, Europeans, or anybody else. You know, this, this is a, this is this factual history. And uh, I hope that when I, those of you that are other races groups are listening to this, uh, to this lecture, would not take it as such. All this is is just a history, a history lesson uh, uh, that, they, uh, that they have not taught you in history school or in history class. And they will never teach you in history class, which is the truth, because history is all has been distorted. American history, the history of the world, a lot of those has been lies about certain people, what they have done. Some of these people didn't even really exist. They never exist. Some people say a miracle if there's a debate on whether this man ever existed or not. You know, America being named after America of Vespucci, that's a lie. A miracle is distorted distortion name of the Al Moroccan or Al Morocco or Al Maruka. 
A M E R U K A. El Morocco more. I mean, the word word more. Or, or you can say uh, 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 Mesoamerica. At one time, both of the Americas and the African continents was joined together. Need a ship or a boat to cross across the Atlantic Ocean. You would just walk across. Because we were all one. It used to be called, uh, some people say, Pangea. Spelled P-A-N-G-E-A. Pangea. Uh, uh, yeah, Pangea. P-A-N-G-E-G-E-A. Uh, Pangean. Okay. Let me go on. Okay, this um, says here, the Gladwin thesis clearly explains in man out of Asia that at least four groups of people migrated to the Americas in the very ancient times. They were the black uh, uh, pygmoids. Pygmoids, okay. Pygmoids, misnomer. It's a misnomer for Twa, again, the Twa people. Okay, it says the black asteroids, misnomer. The Aborigine and indigenous people of so-called Australia, okay, Negro types from Africa, okay, Moors from Africa and Southeast Asia, and the ancestors of the Algonquins, whose pottery style connect them to the region close to Japan. Okay, Japan. Japan. Know the word, the meaning of Japan. Okay. <coughs> The meaning of Japan actually means Japa. Japa means to be ebonite. So the Jap- uh, uh, the original Japanese were also Aboriginal indigenous Moors. They were all over the world, all over the world. The first inhabitants of any con- country on the planet Earth was us, our ancient foremothers and forefathers. Let me go on. Okay. It says here the the Eskimos or Eskimos are the last group of people to migrate to the Americas. See how I pronounce that? It says Eskimos. But I pronounce it Eskimos are the last group of people to migrate to the Americas. The Astroloids, who include the Australian Aboriginals, the Veda and the Munda of India and the Mahra, uh, Mahra, Mahra of southern Saudi Arabia are all members of the black race who once occupied a region from southern Iberia, from Africa, all the way to Australia. These groups are a Negroid as any other branch of the black race, including the Pygmoi types. In fact, remnants of the branch of the black race continue to exist in parts of Africa. The Tubu are an example. In India, a significant number of people belong to this branch of the black race, both the Australian Aboriginals and the Cushitic Negroid types of South Asia were once spread throughout the tropical belt of the earth and existed with blacks of the kinky hair type. Okay. As the asteroid moved into Australia and the Far East, a small number of mixed in with the Mongoloid and the Caucasoid as as these groups came into existence, giving these blacks a wide variation of blood types. Differences in blood type with some African may Africans may also be due to the extensive and lengthy period of time that the asteroids of Australia and those of Africa have been separated. On the other hand, the tribe the tribe the tribals of India, who are classified as a black asteroid, are identical to other Africans in blood type, lack of hair on their bodies, plight of wind, noses, full lips, dark, darkish brown, two blue-black complexion, thick bones, structure, and other features connected to black Africans. A Ugandan scientist pointed out that there were Similar similarities between Indian tribals and Black Africans, and in that they belong to the same genetic circuit 
and race. Those of India uh, ain't going to try to hear that. We all know that. But we know this, uh, uh, the name and not, it's not India. It's Hindustan. And they're Hindustanis, not Indians. That's just the true identical uh, term for them. Okay. All right. Let me see here. Okay, here we go. This remark, according to L.K. Madawi, was made by Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Dr. Reverend E.T. Rupa, at a conference of the world's Aboriginal peoples, according to Dalit Voice, held at Nagpur, India. India's black untouchables, or Dalits, are also among the Aboriginal people of the black asteroid Negro type, whose ancestors were spread from west, I mean, from East Africa all, all the way east to China and further south of Australia. They are, um, they are among the aboriginal peoples of the black asteroid type of India. People who look like today's Australian aborigines may, Austra or people who look like today's Australian aborigines may have begun migrating out of Africa just after 100,000 years ago. It seems that the Australian Aborigines are said to be the furthest away on the chromosomal level of African Africans. However, charts which show the blood types among the various peoples clearly show that the Australian Aborigines may have gradually changed on the level of chromosome over a period of 100,000 years, whereas who are identical to features in the Australian Aborigines, yet presently, presently reside in India, Saudi Arabia, and Africa are identical to other Africans on the chromosomal level. Furthermore, the Australian Aborigine, Africans, and East Indian tribal, tribals contain a large number in their language that are identical and similar in sound and pronunciation. These similarities in racial culture and linguistic characteristics were due to the original uniting of these groups in ancient times. On the other hand, if any of these people or any of these groups had migrated to the Ice Age and cold Europe over 40,000 years ago, it is very possible that they would have turned to the present-day Caucasian population of the North. The fact that the Australoids have straight and curly hair and a few have so-called aquiline features clearly answers the question of the origins of the present-day so-called white peoples of Europe. They came out of the black African Kromaldi man, from whom the Cro-Magnon is said to have, originated, to have originated. It is no surprise that the Australian Aborigines were classified as archaic white <laughs> by anthropologists, which means that in archaic times they were the ancestors of the whites of today. Yeah, right. In other words, the whites originated out of blacks. True. Today's Aborigines and some in, some in, um, entire mass of blacks in Asia, the South Pacific, and Australia and the region consider themselves to be an African racial origins. Their legends, customs, and languages clearly point to an East African origin. The foreign minister of Papua New Guinea, male, the point of the book, The Leap, the black untouchables of India, that all the blacks of the region of Asia and the South Pacific came out of Africa and are descendants of a proto-African people. Okay. Now we're going to start with the eight blacks of the United States. Okay. Well, I'm going to comment on this. Now, dealing with this statement, the ancient blacks of the United States. I'm going to remind you that the United States is not a country. It is a corporation. A corporation out of England. It is a British-owned corporation. Okay. Headed now by Queen Elizabeth II. Under the British crown of England. Okay. Let me go on. Okay, America is the country. Okay, the United States is a corporation. All right, get that out of the way. Let's go on. It is, a, it is very possible that some of the names or parts of the United States that have been classified as Native American names may, in fact, 
be of prehistoric African origins. Place names, okay? Ranging from place names ranging from an area beginning with Florida and stopping at California and Mexico contain a wide variety of names that sound very familiar to African place names. Names such as Kokomongo, Washita, Washita, Kahunga, Oklahoma, are names found in the United States, yet similar names can also be found in Africa as Kokia, Kwasi, Kawanga, Tuli. The last group of their names come from West Africa. There are perhaps thousands of words coming from the Indian languages which show a definite African connection. Moreover, in the locations who the, those names are found, the presence of ancient Africans or their modern descendants has been verified. The Olmecs, who came out of West Africa and the Nile region of the of Northeast Africa and East Central Africa, have been discussed briefly. However, other groups such as the pro-Columbian and the pre-Christian Mandinka speakers of West Africa blacks from Eastern Africa, Swahili civilization and blacks from China and South Pacific also made it to the Americas. The very name California may be of pre-Columbian African origins. That name originated from the name of legendary black Amazon queen Calafia, who existed in California before the Spanish invasion. During this period, the Spanish believed that California was inhabited by blacks. This belief was fortified by a book written by Montiabo de Ordonez called Journey to Esplandian, Esplandian during the year 1500 A.D. Moreover, documentation exists, which includes photographs, logs, paintings, and, and the uh, living descendants of these free Colombian black Californians, which verify the fact that California and much of the southwest stolen and occupied by the Spanish and their descendants was once the land of the black people. This land was not fully occupied until the late 1800s. Many of these native black Americans moved into the cities where they blended with the African-American population migrating from Mexico and the southern United States. J.A. Rogers presents a photograph of one of these real and legitimate owners of California and the Southwest in, in, in his book, America's Gift to America. I would I advise a lot of people to try to get this book if you still can, if, if it's still in print. Uh, it's a very interesting book. Uh, I have lost it a while ago, a couple of years back. I'm going to try to get this book uh, myself. It has a lot of information in it about our history in the Americas and all over the world as well. All right, let me go on. Other books show that blacks being herded by Spanish Californios on horseback just before the period of American occupation of California. Ironically, today, these same invaders, descendants, the lacking of the facts, or pretending to suffer historical amnesia want to claim California and the Southwest as theirs, whereas the entire region belonging to no other than the black race who have lived in the region since prehistoric times. Okay, fair, fair. Uh, I'll go back. Here's the statement he made. Uh, the book showed that the blacks have been herded uh, by Spanish Californios on horseback just before the period of the American occupation of California. Okay, he's um, like American. Well, it's already America anyway. Uh, dealing with the American, North American continent, which is the North Al Moroccan or the Moroccan Empire. A lot of people think when I say that, they think I'm talking about Morocco and Northwest Africa. That is the country. But uh, here you have the Moroccan Empire. Okay. All right, let me go on. 
America, in North Amer- in North America, particularly the continental United States, the president of the black Californians of California and the Southwest, who are more native to this region than any of the blended ethnic ethnic groups who originated in the West and Southwest after the coming of the Spanish. The Washita, the Oshita of the Mississippi region, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, the Yamasee of the Carolinas, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. And we're talking about names, although Alabama, uh, 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 it means Alabama, Allah, A, capital A, L L A H Allah Bama B A M A Alabama. Okay, just want to put that out there. All right, and the Afro Dorianity of the of the Isthmus of Panama, who continues to follow a pre-Columbian lifestyle similar to the, to the other Indians in the region, all are all members of prehistoric pre-Columbian African people who may have sailed either across the Atlantic. The Pacific all walked across the Bering Straits. Apart from these blacks are the tourists of Brazil, a number of isolated black Negroid Indian communities who reside in the coastal and mountainous regions of North South America. Caribs, the Garifuna, who number in the hundreds of thousands of millions, both on their own lands, living on, in urban areas throughout Central America. South America, the Caribbean, and the United States are among a large group of black people of prehistoric and pre-Columbian African origins who exist today. Okay. Some of these blacks have kept vestiges of the ancient cultures and origins which connects them to Africa between 2000 B.C. and the much earlier to the earlier Middle Ages. 500 to 1000 AD. Okay, AD meaning in the year of domination. I know a lot of people think that AD means after the death of Christ. No, that's not what that means. Some that may say, even may say, in the year of our Lord, 1000. Nope, that's not what that means either. Some people say in the year of domination or say in the year of destruction. Okay. All right, but it's mean in the year of domination. That's Moorish Latin. Okay. One important example is the presence of African languages, of pre-Columbian origins, as well as a large amount of African words found today in the languages of Native Americans, as well as the pure version of the African languages now changed in Africa itself, which continue to be spoken as they have been thousands of years ago in Africa. The language of the the Garifunas, spoken by some of the relatives of the authors, is one example. The, the Kichibar languages of South America is another group of languages that, according to Michael Bradley's, is of black African origins. This language may be related to the Mandinka, language groups who whose whose speakers may have settled in Mexico, Central and South America, parts of the Caribbean and even California and the Southwest. In fact the names Tule, Oshita, Cucamonga, as in Cuca, Coquilla, seem to have originated from the Mende Mendinka language, family, Kalifu or Kalafunami. Also, it's a Mandinka origin. These names arrived in the Americas long before slavery and could not have been introduced by powerless Africans over such an extensive area, while names of the Yoruba, Igbo, Ashanti, Kolo, Congo, or the other enslaved African nationalities are not as common or, or, or are very rare, according to Clyde A. Winters. The Olmec's language and in, in, in script is a Mandi, Mandinka origin. Okay? In retrospect, the ancient Africans, whether beginning about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago, during the Olmec civilization, which they, they helped to create, or as originally as the years before 
Christopher Columbus have always been in the Americas. That makes America one of the original homes of blacks in the same manner as all the Southern Asia and South Pacific area, Austria and Caucasian Europe. Okay. Now, in my in my uh, understanding of my own research, uh, we have been uh, it shows, and even in this book here, like I say, if you can get past the uh, the Negroid, Negritic, Black, African American, uh, you know, Negroid, and all these other crazy terms, uh, people have gotten no. Uh, even our own uh, uh, so-called black scholars uh, keep term, terming our people. You know, uh, this is a very uh, informative book, and I recommend a lot of the, uh, uh, you, a lot of you to have it on your bookshelves in your homes. All right? Okay. <coughs> Says here, who were the Olmecs? The Olmecs were members of the West African black racial type. There is also evidence that the same type who inhabited the Nile Quarter and today's Sudan migrated through West Africa, crossed the Atlantic, and settled in Mexico during the formative period of Olmec civilization at about 1200 B.C. to 400 B.C. Another element of the Olmec culture were, in, uh, were of the Asiatic stock with a close resemblance of, uh, to Asians from China rather than in the present Asiatic Native American type of Mexico. Right, yeah, right. Who have mixed in with Africans over the past 4,000 years? Overall, the Olmecs and the Olmec civilization resembles the civilization and cultures of West of, Amer of ancient West Africa, Nubia, and Egypt, respectively. There are various versions on the approximate period of time in black Olmecs, Afro-Olmecs, Begin to Afro Omex. No such thing as Afro Omex. Afro is a hairstyle. All right. Okay. All right. Let me go on. Begin to influence and help build their civilizations. Ivan Van Sertima points out in African presence in early America that a period of four, of nine hundred nine nine forty eight B C to six eighty B C may be the period of cultural flowing flowering experienced by the Omex in Mexico. By the way, uh, uh, Mex uh, uh, that's how Mexico got its name from the Olmec, from the term Olmec, or from the name or word Olmec. Okay, you have uh, a lot of Mexicans that might want to argue with that. Uh, of course, they ain't trying to hear it, and, and they don't want to hear it because it rocks their world. You know, so, but that is the truth. And that's what I'm dealing with, truth. Because a bunch of lies, man, it's, it's nothing. You know, you can build a, you can build a period, a, a pyramid of lies, as high as the pyramids in Giza, as high as the pyramid even in China, the Great Pyramid or the Great Pyramid Mounds here in the Americas, which predates the pyramid in Giza, in Giza and, and Egypt, some thousand years. Believe it or not. And you put, a, if, if, if all those were lies, you could put a, a one rock of truth on top of them, and they will fall. Why? Because it's the lies, they are uh, lies, and they have no real foundation. Because when you build <clears throat> building structures, edifices, stuff like that, it must have a strong foundation, or else it cannot stand. Okay? So that's how we're... Uh, so if you build a pyramid of lies, it won't stand on 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 one top on one rock on top of it of truth. truth. Lies come and goes all the time. But uh, truth never goes away. And truth always uh, be here, long after we are long and gone. The truth stays. Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh. According to Frederick Peterson in, the, in his book, H. Mexico, we can trace the progress of man in Mexico without noting any definite old world influence during this period, 1650 B.C., except for a strong Negroid substratum connected with the, magi the magicians. 
Alexander von Wuppenthal is, is more direct. He states in unexpected faces in, a, in his book, Unexpected Faces in Ancient America, the startling fact is that in all parts of Mexico, from Campeche in the east to the south coast of Guerrero, and from the Chapias next to Guatemala, border to the uh, Panuco River and the Huasteca region north of Veracruz. Archaeological pieces representing Negro or Negro people have been found, especially in archaic, archaic and pre-classic sites. Michael D. Core explains further in regards to the period of Olmec civilization. A long series of radiocarbon dat dates from the important Olmec sites of La Venta span the centuries span the centuries from 800 to 400 BC, placing the major development of this culture entirely within the middle formative. There is now there is now not the slightest doubt that all, all later civilization in Mesoamerica, America, whether Mexica, Mex Mexican or Maya, ultimately rests on an Olmec base. Some writers place a much earlier date for the people of Olmec civilization in Mesoamerica. Willard P. Luce submitted a photograph of a young, so-called black male with kinky hair and Negroid racial features to the magazine Ancient American. Issue number 13, his captors states young Negro. Note, kicking hair, style, and very similar to Negro by Wuthenthal, 17, 1975, figure, 19, uh, figure nine, uh, 97. Wuthenthal says his piece is from Tabasco, Mexico, and it's pre-classic, 1500 B.C. to 250 A.D. The specimen from the same period, probably the same date as figure four. It is a 4.4 centimeter high. Luce concludes in his article, from 3,000 years ago up until the time of the early Spanish explorers, there is a continued record of Negro presence in Mesoamerica. Hmm. There is also evidence of a of, of, of very early human occupation in South America and Mexico. It seems to this writer that these early inhabitants more likely came came from Africa than from Asia. Until we know how Negroes came to be Mexico to be in Mexico as early as Olmec times, we cannot assume that the Asiatic migrants preceded Negroes in the New World. The Asiatic migrants eventually became dominant can be attributed to the, uh, the four larger numbers of people coming from the, from the north and then those who were able to cross the Atlantic. Okay. It is quite obvious that a significant portion of the Olmec civilization was created by Africans from West Africa during the Nok civilization. 3000 BC to 400 AD, as well as the Africans from the Nile region, Egypt, Sudan, who were also a part of the populations of West Africa during this period, as well as long as the period of classic Nubian civilization. 4500 BC to 4500 AD, it is clear that the Nubians, Chemites, and West Africans and Canaanites, who were Negro and were called the Phoenicians, or Phoenicians, made joint journeys back and forth between Africa and the Americas between 3000 B.C. to 500 B.C., even with the destruction of the Phoenician commercial power and the occupation of Egypt by so-called white Asiatics and Arabs. The West Africans continued to make journeys to the Americas on their own until the very day Columbus landed in the region. In fact, these journeys continue to the early 1500s A.D. Okay. Now I must come in again. Okay, in this in this phrase as white Asiatics. Okay, first of all, there's no such thing as white Asiatics. There's no such thing as white people. They don't exist. It's, 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 it's a status. It's a status, not the identity of a real people, of any real group of people in the human family. See, they were Europeans, or we can say Abions. Okay? 
I'm going to get uh, I mean, uh, uh, touch on that more on another subject and on another lecture. All right. Okay, here's here. The Olmec origins. The fact that the Olmecs were of Bronze Age Black African origins cannot be underestimated. Previous statements and references in this text underscore this fact. Yet the origins of the Black Olmecs in the regions outside of Africa, yet with African inhabitants and culture bringers who established themselves in these lands, must be taken into account. In other words, a prehistoric in prehistoric times, the Nubian Egyptian West African Phoenician civilization and culture was a worldwide phenomenon, which was not restricted to Africa and the Mediterranean. Mediterranean mean, meaning Middle Sea. That's what Mediterranean means. Okay, and go on. But was spread from Spain in the West through Mesopotamia, the Arabian Peninsula, India, as far as China. Okay. Has their so called black Olmec origins in China. The very first people to inhabit China were most likely Negroid types from Africa who migrated to China during the great migrations of Africa, Africans from Africa to every part of the world between 200,000 BC to 100,000 BC, and frankly, after, afterwards, up until the Middle Ages, when so called black Moors, no such thing as black Moors. He had the black as capitalized, so therefore it is descriptive of how we look. It's a description, or it is uh, you can uh, use an adjective in describing a noun, because Moors is a proper noun. Those are proper nouns, and black is an adjective describing a proper noun. But that's not who we are. Black Moors are not who we are. We are Moors, period. Okay. Okay, after the Boers left West Africa and the Maghreb and the spread to both Europe and the Americas, the Maghreb meaning Morocco, or Morocco extreme, or you can say uh, Maghreb al Aqsa, meaning uh, Morocco extreme to the West. They're talking about here in the Americas, the Almorocks, or Al Morocco, which is a uh, misnomer America. Actually, we are the true Americans, since we are the first inhabitants, since we are, and it says in this book here. Therefore, we are the true Americans. All right. Okay, the West Africa the Maghreb spread both in Europe and the Americas. Negroid traces in China date to early as 50,000 B.C., a period when the Mongoloid type did not exist. During this historic period of Chinese history, when, when the very first Chinese dynasties were began, blacks were a significant part of the population of China. In fact, the first dynasty of the Zhu Xia and the end with the Xia and the second, the Shang, were founded by Asiatic blacks between 2200 B.C. to 1100 B.C. Okay. In regards to China's earliest foundation inhabitants, who created Chinese civilization during the early period of their history? Wayne Chandler explains in his in his African presence in early America, studies done on skeletal types may provide us with a few answers. Several theories have been put forward to explain the racial identity of the Shang inhabitants. The skeletal types excavated have been placed into the five categories two largest being the classical Mongoloid type and the Oceanic Negroid type. Of these two, the second subgroup seems to stand out as the major influence in Shang culture. Indeed, I feel it would be in order to state that it was the Shang who literally laid the cornerstone of early Chinese culture. A quotation for Xi Jing, Book of Olds, and uh, circa 900-500 B.C., and Semakin, circa 90 B.C., gave, gave some historical insight into the coming of these black people to northeast China. To the people of Shang, the people of Shang heaven ordered the black bird to descend and to give birth, according to the Xi Jing, the Book of Otis. The connection between the ancient 
black dynasties of China, such as Xia, 2250 B.C. to 1776 B.C., and the Shang, 1766 B.C. to 1122 B.C., but the Olmecs of Mexico is one that has been thoroughly explained by Wayne Chandler and others. The fact of oceanic African and Mongoloid Chinese settlement in China in the very early stages of ancient Chinese civilization, 2500 B.C. to 2200, and the possibility that these two groups are migrated to the Americas is very likely. The African all-black makeup of the Shang Dynasty was a clear by the Shu invaders who overthrew the Shang dynasty, J.A. Rogers states in Sex and Race, Volume 1, that Shu's described the Shang as having black and oily skin. Moreover, according to K.C. Shang, a miniature jade figure from Xiao Dun and Xiao Shei Xiong suggests Negroid features, flattened nose, prominent chins, and foreheads, and the lack of the uh, Pegasus fold that the Mongoloid possesses. <coughs> I may add to this that uh, I doubt it very seriously that in China, China that they are teaching their children this part of their history. If anybody tell me that, I doubt it very seriously. I have to go to uh, China, all lengths, to all kind of lengths of pr- trouble to get to China to see this myself. But I doubt it very seriously they are teaching their people. That the, uh, that a uh, lot of uh, our Moors are part of their history, and the first part of their history. I have nothing against the Asian people or the Chinese people or what you would say the Manchurian people, which is uh, what the, which is who they really are, Manchurians, not Chinese. I have explained earlier that China is the corporation country. The the country is Manchuria, but most Chinese don't even know themselves. And most Chinese don't even know themselves that we are the first start of their civilization and culture in China. Their culture came from us. Chinese are not going to try to hear that. You know, so, all right. Let me go on. It says here, the facial characteristics of Omex sculpture, which present humans clearly depicts two distinct racial types. The black African Negro type found throughout Africa and a Mongoloid type, which closely resembles the Chinese regional Mongoloid type. Representations of mixtures of the two races also occur in Omec, shade, stone, and other plastic arts. The migration of the black and Mongoloid Shang people to Olmec, Mexico, may have been due to the invasion of their kingdoms by barbarism from the north, specifically the Shao. Moreover, it was the Shao invaders of China who overthrew the Shang dynasty about 1122 B.C. and the overall history of black civilization, a period over 17,000 years. This is a relatively recent period. According to Rafiq A. Zabahari, an ancient ancient Egyptian and Chinese in America in 1121 B.C., the Shao leader, Wu Wang attacked Shao, the ruler of Shang, before before he did so. He he accused him of being the bounce and, and the bounce and thinking only of palaces, buildings, terraces, groves, dikes, pools, and extravagant clothing, to the neglect and ruin of the people, and of spreading pain and poison over the four, four seas. He exhorted his men to attack tigers and panthers on conquering the Shang, he respected their intelligent men. He distinguished the families of the clever men among the enemy who have gone away. Wayne Chandler lists a number of traits similar between the black the black Shang dynasty of China and the Africans of and the black Olmecs. Okay, he started off with one. Shang triple bronzes and triple ceramics of the U.S. Southwest, Central, and South America are similar, according to Nigel Davis. Two, connection between African serpent, Chinese dragon, African lion, Chinese tiger, and jaguar of Miss America as being a great spiritual significance. Three, similarities in the guizo of sitting used by Shang and Omex. Four, 
similarities in African sitting positions with that of the Chinese and Olmecs. Five, the importance of the bird to describe people used by the Olmecs and the Shang. Six, Mohawk, Broad Ridge, parentheses, Broad Ridge, hairstyle, used first in early China by the blacks, brought to Mexico by the Shang. Seven, the importance of cats protecting children in plastic art found in Shang and Olmec, as well as the South American civilization. <clears throat> Eight, shaman with object in each hand, began by Shang, also portrayed by the Shaw, Olmecs, South Americans, and Africans. Nine, nose plugs used by blacks as, as Shang, China, Olmec priests, still used today in Africa. Okay, the above characteristics are among the many similarities and cultural traits found between the Olmecs, the Black Shang Dynasty of China, and the ancient African civilization of West Africa, Egypt, and Nubia. The landing of a series of <clears throat> Black Shang people from China and West Mexico who were fleeing from the takeover of their kingdom by the Shaw barbarians from the northern regions of China contributes to the evidence that that clearly shows a Mongoloid Asiatic invasion into a settled, civilized, and advanced black civilization in central and southern China. These blacks were part of the makeup of the Olmec civilization between 1100 B.C. to 400 A.D. The greatest influence on Olmec civilization, culture, and the makeup of the primary inhabitants responsible for the transmission of old world culture and civilization to Mexico can from Africa rather than than from the Pacific. There are numerous trail trait similarities between African in the Nile region and West Africa with the black Olmecs of ancient of ancient ancient Mexico, which points to a more significant African contribution to Olmec civilization. <clears throat> okay. It says here the Nubian Egyptian contribution to Olmec civilization. <clears throat> the current archaeological digs as well as the finding of historical artifacts is working to greatly heighten the significance of ancient Nubian to Seti at the very first region on Earth where civilization originated. In fact, Nubian civilization superseded Egyptian civilization by thousands of years. <clears throat> Scott McLeod discusses what many unbiased historians and Pan-African historians have claimed for many decades. He writes in Time magazine, Nubia, not Egypt, may have been the first true African civilization. He describes a very important expedition to northern Sudan undertaken by archaeologist Timothy Rand Kendall. The archaeologist Timothy Randall, at least fifteen at least fifteen teams from the US, Europe, and Sudan are siphoning through the same sands for secrets of the ancient Nubia, the world first the world's first black civilization, and which is the world's so called black civilization anyway, which as height extended more than one thousand miles along the Nile River from the what is today today Sudan to the southern reaches of Egypt. The scholars have been convinced for at least 20 years, that the Nubians were not merely vassals or trading partners with the Egyptians, but builders of their own ancient and impressive civilization, which culture was the most complex and cosmopolitan in all Africa. Okay. Two kingdoms, has, two kingdoms that existed between 1000 B.C. to 350 A.D., these were Napata and Miro. The Olmec civilization developed during this core period of Nubian civilization, a period when the Nubians were masters of the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic, most specifically between 1000 B.C. to 600 B.C. When they ruled Egypt or were part of the military class of the Egyptians, the cloud observes, French archaeologists have found exquisite ceramic figurines, bowls, and funerary objects at sites that date from 
from uh, at least 8,000 BC. They are told they are told as the Neolithic sites in Africa and predate prehistoric finds in Egypt by a staggering 3,000 years. Whoa. Okay. Although Scott McCloud essay to Time Magazine is one in a series of such articles appearing in magazines such as Time, National Geographic, and others. Over the past 20 years, one of the true African origins and the significance of the African development of the very first civilizations. Other, others have been written extensively on both Egypt and Nubia and on the connection with the Olmec civilization of Mesoamerica. Alexander von Rubenthal writes in African Discovery, African Presence in Early America. Most convincing of the presence of Africans in the New World is, of course, the famous colossal stone head of, of Trizapotis. Number two, not only an account of its purely Negroid features, but even more so by its typically Ethiopian braided pigtails, ending in rings and tassels. This head first reappears in recent times in the Nile Valley civilizations, addition by Ivan van Sertima. It has been seldom displayed among other Olmec heads. Von Wuppenthal makes the case for the old world African connection, Egyptian Nubian. He, he discusses the Olmec site of Chalazinga, Mexico, in the state of Morolos, Moro, where a large African head was carved on the rock hundreds of feet above the archaeological site below. He sees some significance in the connection with the direction the head faces across the Morolos, or the Morolos, whichever you the word, okay, plains to the snow-capped volcano Popocopetepel and other Omec veneration of the mountains as a possible route to the underworld. He writes, after all, it seems to have been the reason for sending the Nubian expedition to the west over the over the, over the the Atlantic by Ramses III. I'm going to stop right here. Ramses III, Ramses III, I'm looking for this book called Ramses the Third, the father of of America, or the father of the Americas, or a master of the Americas. <clears throat> I have I haven't found that book. Uh, it's a hard book to get. Last thing I heard is a very very expensive book to get. So we all know why that is. They still don't want us to know the truth about our history and of their history as well. Like I said, the truth always rock their world. Up the, up the, it upsets the world big time. So, okay, let me go on. Another detail for this interpretation is the fact that the black helmet with a round knob, identical with a helmet worn by a member of the Sheridan bodyguard of the pharaoh depicted on this tomb, on his tomb. Mm. The Nubian presence in ancient Mexico and their contribution to Olmec civilization is one of the most significant contributions from the old world and particularly from Africa to pre-Columbian American culture, compared to the observation of archaeologists and others that the Omex may have been influenced by members of the Black Shang Dynasty of China. Many others believe that the Omex were directly influenced by the Nubians and Egyptians. Ivan Van Sertima includes a number of cultural and artists' similarities between the Nubians and Black Omex. For example, Van Sertima points out that in that year, 1938, an archaeological team directed by Matthew Sterling rediscovered this huge head with a helmeted dome eight, dome eight feet in height, 18 feet in circumference. It weighed over 10 tons. Hmm. Van Sertima makes this important comparison since the typical Negro African features on the sculptures were unlike any other sculpture attributed to the American Indians. It says here, in this realism, its size, its awesome bodiness, its alien features and headgear, it stood out among American sculptures. Only the colossal bodiless heads of Nubian blacks and other racial types found at Tennis, the harbor of for seagoing shifts in Egypt and can parallel this head in scale or conception 
in the ancient world. Mm. Okay. Getting on here. Okay, still got some time. It says that Van Sedeman referred to the close similarities between the war helmets of the ancient Nubians and those carved on the ancient Olmec stoneheads. He described these helmets as uncannily similar to leather helmets worn by the Egyptian Nubian military in the era of Ramesses. He described their helmets as covering the head and back of the neck, and they have tie-ons attached to the crest and falling in front of the, in front of the ears. It has the circular earplug and the incised decorative parallel lines found on the colossal Nubian heads in the Egyptian port of Tunis. Other cultural similarities between the Omec stone heads and similar sculpture found in Nubia, Egypt, with the use of one head at Laventa as an oracle or animated talking god. This head is nine feet high. According to Van Sertima, it has a flat surface at the top, which was used as an altar. There is a hole in the left ear of, a, of this colossal head, which was used by the Olmec priest to in, in, imitate the speech of, of a god through the mouth of the massive head. Van Sertima writes, it is strongly reminiscent of the technique, technique used in the talking god of the Nubians and Nubians in the first millennium B.C. Amun-Ra. Mm. Millennium mean 1,000 years B.C., okay, before Christ or before Christianity. Okay, Amun-Ra. Okay, the blacks made it into an animated god. The statue of Amun-Ra was jointed, a priest being especially appointed to work, to work it, and in the Sanctuaries, hiding places were arranged in the thickness of the wall from which the priests skillfully arranged for the oracular voice of the god to be heard. One should have absolutely no doubt as to the African orders of the persons whom the giant Olmec stoneheads betray. Their racial origin is clearly African negritic. Still, the insistence by some who continue to give the Olmecs a a conclusive origin solely in Asia and no African connections or influence is, be, is, is itself unwise for even the Oceanic Negroid type traits their origins in Africa. These Oceanic Negroids arrived in their present location throughout Asia and South Pacific after long migrations have began over 100,000 years ago. Tagama, the foreign minister of Papua New Guinea, made it clear in an interview with Black Book's Bulletin, according to Ranuka Rashidi, 1987, that the blacks of Asia and Africa are related. Tagama explains Africa is over is, is, is our motherland. All of the black population which settled in Asia over the hundred, hundreds of thousands of years came undoubtedly from the African continent. In fact, the entire world was populated from African peoples. We were linked to Africa in the past. We are linked to Africa in the present. We will be linked to Africa in the future. These statements by Papua New Guinea Foreign Minister Ben Togama clearly points to the African origins of the blacks of Asia. They are claimed to be being original inhabitants of all Asia since no other homo sapiens existed in Asia except members of the black race and most importantly the right of the black race in Asia to establish themselves as a major force in the region, particularly in India, the South Pacific, Melanesia, and Australia, and the right of blacks to an occupied land as Southeast Asia to do whatever is necessary with the help of blacks and people of goodwill elsewhere to regain their stolen lands and maintain economic, military, and cultural strength as well as the right to increase and expand their black populations. Alexander von Rudenthal makes a very important comment concerning the difficulty that some anthropologists have in recognizing that the blacks of Asia, including the aborigines of Australia, are of prehistoric African origins. Wayne Chandler explains this situation clearly. Okay. 
Dr. Alexander von Wuderthal tells an interesting story which illustrates this reluctance to give Africa and Africans their proper due. After Aaron Palm, his theories on transatlantic voyages by Negroes to the New World, Palm advised, Wuderthal never say Negro, always say Negroid. Both of them are fucked up names. So let me go on. Uh, because then it should, then it would be mean that the black specimens of the pre Columbian aren't we derive from Melanesian Negro toast and not from African Negroes. With these all terms are misnomers. You know, misnomer Negroid, misnomer Negro toast, misnomer African Negroes, and whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay. Let me go on. Dr. Wunenthal points out that although some scientists are now beginning to accept the possibility of Melanesian blacks from the South Pacific migrations to America, but to reject the idea of African contact with the Americas before Columbus, apart from the obvious black or African origin, so-called negritic racial features, I mean, features and characteristics of much Olmec stone and terracotta, Art which portray humans, a number of other traits are shown to the very to the to be very similar to the art and cultural practices in ancient as well as modern Africa, particularly the Nile Valley, Sudan, Ethiopia, and West Africa. Van Sertima lists these traits common among the ancient Nubian Egyptians. The true Egyptian, the Omex, which points to the African origins of these customs. It's a, a number of uh, um, one, number one, the double crown, which, pres- which represented Upper and Lower Egypt, were worn by the Egyptians and the Nubians during the Nubian dyn- dynasty, circa 750 to 656 B.C. Two, the royal barge was called by the name Sipak in the Olmec Maya language and Sibak in Egyptian. Purple was used by the Nubian Egyptian and the Olmecs. Purple was also used by the ancient Mexican women of rank as shown in the Nubal Codex. Okay. The artificial beard was by the Nubian Egyptian well as at the ancient Omex. Five. Fans and sunshades made by feathers were used by Nubians just also by the ancient Mexico Teutonics. Vern Sintima points out that the ancient Egyptian N used the colors blue, red, and green. The ancient Mexican used blue, red, and green, and light green. Number six, the parasol was another object used by the ancient Egyptian Nubians, West Africans, and the ancient Mexicans. The parasol is mentioned as one of the items brought to ancient Mexico by outsiders, according to the oral history, recorded to the Tupuro Coyo in an ancient Maya book. It states that these things came from the east, from the other side of the water and the sea. They came here. They had their thrones, their little branches and stools. They had their parasol and 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 bone flutes. The previous cultural similarities are among a few of the tr- of the traits which c- connect Olmec civilization and the Olmec people themselves with Africans from Egypt and Nubia. West Africa connection with the Omex is also strong. Here's here the West African origin of the Omex. There are many characters among the ancient Omex of Mexico, Central America, which can to West Africa or a civilization that located in the West Africa. The ancient times with roots or connection in ancient Egypt and Nubia during the time of Omex dynasty, 1100 B.C. to 400 A.D. One of the ancient Africa's greatest civilizations flourished in the region, which became the Kingdom of Ghana. Moreover, according to more better news, South Holland, Illinois, to early as 15,000 B.C., the Zinga Empire ruled by the Emperor Terus Afrique, existed in the region which became the ancient Ghana. I spoke of Ter- uh, Terus the early in this book. He was the one that uh, created the flag, the red, black, and green. As most of you should know, are familiar with this flag. Colors of the flag mean, as of, as uh, related to our people. Okay. However, unlike the Ghana of the Middle Ages, 1400 A.D. to 1000 B.C. Um, A.D., 
The Ghana of 3000 B.C. to 400 A.D. was one of the world's wealthiest kingdoms, despite its distance from Egypt and major regions of black civilization in Northeast Africa, the Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, India, Ethiopia, and South Arabia. The condition of West African civilization between 3000 B.C. to about 400 A.D. is one of the needs careful research and study, yet there are many clues and facts which to build a clear picture of the type of culture that existed in the region and how the culture uh, led to the transportation of people and, I- and ideas about 1,500 uh, miles from the Atlantic to the Americas. At least one advanced culture and civilization existed in West Africa between 3000 B.C. to 500 B.C., this culture was called the Milk Culture and is responsible for numerous highly artistic works in stone, terracotta, bronze, iron, gold, silver, copper, and other metals. Works in ivory and wood are also available, although much of the wood artifacts, carvings, and practical implements created over the past 4,000 years may have rotted away. Okay. Here's something here. It says here. Uh, the um, it says here that uh, see Africa, won migrations by ship, boats, and cure boats inside inside the lake, field Sahara, and across the oceans. The last groups of blacks to migrate to the Americas in prehistoric times was a group called the Clovis Folsom Point Blacks. Indeed, this group of blacks to migrate, uh, uh, to migrate the Americas in pre the last group of blacks to migrate to, uh, to the Americas in prehistoric times, approximately 6,000 B.C., may be the Oshita, Washita, the damn lie. We are the oldest indigenous group in the people of the world. So why is he saying that? Okay. And I'm not going to get excited about it. Let's see. Still exists as still a negritic group. Never call ourselves negritic people. Okay, some of the occupied occupied lands in the U.S. These lands included perhaps over five million acres in the states of Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Mississippi. These states are part of the Washita ancient empire. According to the Empress of the Washita Oshita Nation, the Washita immigrated from the ancient continent of Mu. Uh, where another, another place where more the word more came from M U U R now it's spelled M O O R. Okay, this continent was said to be in the South Pacific, a region that was and still and inhabited by millions of Aboriginal blacks of of so-called blacks of the so-called Negritic type, as mentioned. Pitifully large group of misnomered blacks who migrated from West Africa to the Sahara during the late prehistoric era before 4000 BC. Writers such as Willard P. Lutz examined the possibility of the Africans may have also migrated to the Americas from Africa from the, across the Atlantic. Lutz writes, in South America, proceeding south to north, you find these dates. Monte Verde, Chile, 3,000 years. Pedro Ferreira, Brazil, at least 32,000 BP. Or Flea Cave, Peru, 20,000 years BP. Valesquia, southern Mexico, is radio carbonated at 21,000 years BP. Putting on all these dates in the proper places in the map suggested that these are two different groups of early man and the Western Hemisphere. And that this group advancing from the south, from the south to the north as earlier from the Asiatic migration by a substan- substantial margin. If man entered the Americas, let's see here. If man entered the Americas through South America, as some archaeologists have believed, they probably originated in Africa. The Olmecs did not only carve carve starworks with typical Negroi speakers, but other stone works were distinctly Mongoloid and un- and, and characteristically Chinese or Far Eastern. For example, the carrying of an Olmec shaman beholding a ritualistic 
object clearly depicts eyes that are of a bungaloid and of eastern. It's turned down lips, the so-called jaguar mouth feature found in some types of portrayals of Asiatics and an Asian racial characteristics typical among the bungaloids. These features has confused some historians and anthropologists who have also found that the typical Negroid type of mouth and have also labeled them jaguar mouth and an apparent effort to confuse the reader and hide the fact that they represent Negritic Omex and not Asiatic Omex. Some archaeologists and historians have con uh, concentrated only on the aspect of Omex art and with the characters of the jaguar and the human are fused to create a mythological being found on Omex religion. They have placed emphasis in these cast characters and have Skyly Incorporated, which are distinctly Negritic racial characteristics and features as part of this aspect. In an effort to further confuse the reader, at the same time, the obvious and the definite Negritic characteristics evident in a very large number of Omec artwork, which portrays humans, are deliberately ignored or glossed over. Michael Cole explains this clearly in this book, Mexico. The hallmark, the hallmark of Olmec civilization in the art style is the most unusual aspect is the iconography on which it is based, to which we glimpse a religion of the strange sort. The Olmec evidently believed that at some distant time and pace and, and time in the past, a woman had cohabited with the jaguar. <laughs> Anyway, contributed to the liniments of fellings and stint and men. These monsters are usually shot in Omec art as somewhat infantile throughout life with the puffy features of small, fat babies, snarling mouths, toothless gums, or long, curved fangs, or seven claws. The purpose of such a combination of an Omec art must not be mistaken for these aspects of Omec art. Represents Afrocard racial characteristics. Yet it is in the feline human combination that biased writers and anthropologists have used to cover up the obvious Negro aspect of Omec art, although they have not been totally successful in that endeavor. Still, they have gone as far as describing Negro facial features such as full lips, puffy faces, straight eyes, flat noses, high foreheads, as infantile or baby face features rather than Negritic African characteristics of much Omec art. Still, writers, historians, and anthropologists such as Alexander von Wutenthal are straightforward and honest in their description of what is obviously Negritic African people portrayed in much Omec art. A summary of von Wutenthal's Humanitas Americas collection clearly, accurately, and unbiasedly describes people who are African blacks. Says there a a misnomer black pieces on a spell of displaying an empty cartouche, cartouche on which von Wuttenthal states that this, according to Science Gordon of New York University, means she's displaying a scent. B the body of a dwarfish, chubby black girl over two thousand years old from Las Bogas, Mexico. Figure four. C figure six a from the Alcapulco shows a black person with kinky hair. Okay. Okay, D. Figure 6 shows a black African girl with a nose ring and uh, braided hair, slightly slanted eyes, earplugs. E. Figure 6 shows figure 6 D shows a figure with ex exaggerated mouth. The piece was made of clay. F, figure 8 and 9 come from the late pre-classic Omec, Omec uh, period and portrays exaggerated negritic features including the Mohawk type hairstyle common all over Africa even today. G, Alexander von Wutenthal describes this early African negritic head as the first classic terracotta and we should and no number and, and and we show and number ten is kept in the museum of the state of Veracruz and Alapa, 
like all other places in this book, its features speak for themselves. This head was a colloid to face a characteristic found on only among African, although Melanesian blacks also used colloid scarification as a right. And the skeptic tribe, a region of New Guinea, a part of the crocodile cult. Bear in mind that the crocodile god of ancient Kemet, Egypt, was called Sebek. Von Wuthenthal states that this depiction of the eyes is a reminiscent of terracotta from the low period in Nigeria, about 500 B.C. H, figure 11 to 18, all show negritic characteristics from the high foreheads, Fragantism, cornrow hairstyles, colored tattoos, afro hairstyle, and other features. Figure 18 is quite interesting, for it shows a representation of an African mongoloid mixture. Figures from 19 to 28 all show negative features. One aspect of Olmec, or art, seems to include mostly a combination of human and cat-like features, as shown on page. 27, 274 of African presence in early America of a human with the head of a feline from Pueblo, Mexico, dating to 1150 B.C. A figure on page 267 will ever seem to be a sexless male with negative features. The presence of the Jaguar Negroid Omec let's get this here Omec characteristics and Omec anthropomorphic as are bringing the question to whether a Jaguar coat developed alongside black Olmec rule and occupation of Mexico at a, at a time when Mongoloids or Asiatics who occupy some parts of ancient Mexico. Okay, I wish I would. I like to. I'm still haven't finished yet, but they. Uh, it's time to get off the air. Okay. Uh, like I, as I say in all of my lectures, I do not wish to insult anyone. But I wish to bring the truth and true history to the world and to the rest of the human family, as I as I have studied and as as I learned, and I want you to uh, to share what I've learned. I want to share that with you, and what I see to be the truth through my uh, uh, research and through the culture of our people and the history of the true history of our people, the people that has been distorted for many years and uh, have not been really uh, told in history classes across the world and especially in the schools in this continent or this country. So I say to you, uh, uh, good night. If you have any questions, just call, you can call my number, 314 Area code 644-4425. Area code is 314. Phone number is 644-4425. Call Dr. Eileen Dutapaki Obey. His number is 9, uh, 910-364-9099.